I forgot to mention this session we recorded uh, because we're going to put it up on YouTube later. <coughs> Okay, sorry guys for the technical <laughs> problems, huh? Um, why is it uh, why is it repeating? Hmm? The sound is repeating. When I say something, oh, okay, good. Uh, okay. Uh, this is part three of a three-part series on Singapore's past, present, and future, right? Uh, in part one, uh, I already outlined that uh, since 1945, uh, the Anglo-American order is, is prevailed upon us. And therefore, uh, the kind of independence that uh, we were given is actually conditioned by the by the overarching uh, power that be, right? And that was all part of the, the, the agreement uh, that after World War II, that the, uh, the decolonized countries will be... Uh, still under the American order, okay? Uh, and, then, and then, of course, Britain then urged Malaysia to be formed. Uh, it failed, and Singapore had to get out. Uh, and then, of course, Lee Kuan Yew cried, and I gave the reason why he cried, right? Now, part two, uh, once Singapore is out of Malaysia, it had lost its hinterland, and therefore, it had to become a global city, meaning that it cannot, it does not have any... Uh, uh, resources except people in a small island city state. Therefore, it has to be an uh, investment center for international capital to, to uh, locate in Singapore. And under this condition, there was no choice. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew had to, and he knew, he knew it, he had to discipline the Singaporean uh, in order to succeed so that the foreign investors would not be any problem with with labor strikes and, and, and street protests and all those kinds of things, right? So the disciplining process happened and um, the Singapore state uh, therefore prospered, but the Singapore people became weak and complacent. This is the, the situation we are in. So the existing global order, right, uh, is, is, is now, uh, well, the last uh, uh, 40, 50 years, we have uh, profited. Singapore was a great uh, entrepot center as well as an investment center for international business. So we made a lot of money. The state became very rich and very powerful, but people became very weak. Um, so the existing global order is now beginning to falter. We all know that, right? There's a geopolitical struggle between the West and, and China and, and so on. And uh, there's also uh, some structural changes going on 
within the uh, global economy and and, and uh, it's 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 now kind of uh getting into a situation in which cost of living has gone up tremendously the price of money has gone up and uh, people are losing their jobs and so on so this is a survival situation that we are facing and what i'm arguing for in part 3 is that we we need to 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 take very bold steps right in order to uh rekindle the kind of uh revolutionary spirit in the new asia pacific order that uh, we are in now in, the term uh, asia pacific order is very interesting it's a term that uh, all of us in asia use uh whereas the americans and the the, the american uh, uh uh proxy states uh, australia japan south korea and so on they use the term indo pacific right so this is a very interesting distinction we make we do not want to use the indo pacific uh, nomenclature because that is a signal of american uh, 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 order okay so what is the future that is the, the the topic right so the global economy is failing and uh, this is a statement by joseph stiglitz right that it's in free fall the great re recession as it has come to be called has impacted more people worldwide than any crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s, right? Uh, flawed government policy, and this is uh, Stiglitz uh, criticizing American flawed government policy and unscrupulous personnel and corporate behavior in the United States created the current financial meltdown. 19, uh, uh, 2008 was a, was a terrible demonstration of this uh, financial meltdown. Uh, and this was exported across the entire globe with devastating consequences. And we are still uh, in the process of recovering from that. Uh, on top of that, <laughs> the COVID-19 situation has made things even worse. So now we are facing uh, a, t a terrible situation, right? Uh, the depression, the, uh, the impact of, of recovering from COVID. And, and on top of that, uh, <laughs> new technology, right? AI. Uh, robotics and so on is threatening uh, employment and, and, and so many things are changing in the in the system uh, so we are again uh, unlike the 1960s early 60s uh, we, when we were entering into a very uh, uh, conflicted time we are now entering into a revolutionary time and we must dare to be revolu revolutionary Right. I'm not talking about revolutionary in a kind of a Marxist sense or, or, or in a communist sense at all. I'm talking about uh, uh, we have to be very bold and therefore very very courageous and that and that that to think beyond outside of the box. Right. Uh, so that is the the situation we are in. We're heading into a multipolar world. We are living in conflicted times. There's no escape from this reality. Uh, and we need money and vision. Now, this is a very interesting point, right? Uh, investment finance. <laughs> this is a very interesting point, which uh, in my discussion with uh, Tamasic uh, Holdings, senior people in Tamasic uh, in Singapore, um, which is the biggest uh, government uh, investment company. Uh, the, the point that uh, I made with them, and they agreed that the world is flooded with idle money. Uh, and they are paying offshore banks about half percent interest in order to keep their their accounts secret as well as to keep it safe, right? But with Singapore's triple A financial status, I'm told that uh, Singapore can raise finance easily provided uh, there are capable and talented fund and project managers in Singapore. Now, this is where the problem begins, right? We have the money but we don't have the people because the people have been weakened so much in the last uh, uh, 40 years, right? Um, and it's very interesting that uh, in yes yesterday's paper, uh, there's a report that uh, our Singapore students uh, in our schools have scored the highest in, in science and mathematics in the whole world. <laughs> so my, my response to that is yes, we are, we are very good in scholastics, but do we have the 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 courage the guts and the 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 initiative and all those things that are terribly important in order to be uh, uh, innovative and, and and progressive right we we only uh, uh, 
learn how we only know how to work within the rules. But the situation in which we are facing requires us to work outside of the rules. How do we how do we create? That's a problem. So what needs to be done is the subject of today's discussion. How how do we turn Singapore into an enterprise city with weak people but but uh, incredibly rich and strong government? <laughs> this is a, a, a very strange kind of conundrum, right? Uh, how do we attract the best and the brightest to live, learn, and earn with our best and brightest in Singapore, right? Because if we can do that, right, the friendships that they form together will be the basis for rapid eco-regional uh, development of uh, of this whole region of which the, the little red dot, which is Singapore, can become a vibrant uh, 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 force to, to, to engage the whole region, right? And this is something which I, I want to, to, to get the views of our friend in, in Kuala Lumpur, Mr. Yusmadi, as one of our contest, uh, 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 commentators to respond, right? How do we work together? That's the issue, right? So how do we change the Singapore mindset? Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a few very radical uh, suggestions. Uh, number one, Singapore is, is uh, made up of five uh, uh, community development councils. These are the five, right? You have the Northeast District, Southeast District, the Northwest District, the Southwest District, and the Central District. These are five uh, uh, community development councils that coordinate the social uh, uh, work within these communities, um, integrating the, 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 the local community movements, the people's associations in the various districts, the schools, the, the, the NGOs in that area, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm suggesting that in order to change the mindset, to open the mind, we change these five community development councils into five local governments in which they elect their own mayors. Right now, the mayors are appointed by, by the, the central government and, and, and all the instructions are completely uh, 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 not transparent to the, to the districts which they serve, right? Yes, they've done a good job, but I think we need to move to the next step and that is to have local governments, right? What, what does local government means, mean, right? We have to... The, the, these local governments will be elected, right? The mayor has to be elected. Right now, the mayor is appointed, right? Just like the Swiss uh, canton system, in which the cantons are self-governing, they elect their own people, and then they send representatives to the head, uh, to, to the central government, who then... Uh, uh, run the foreign policy, the finance, and the uh, uh, security of the state. Okay, all local issues should be run by the local districts, right? So there will there should be five uh, housing development boards. There should be five planning agencies. There should be five uh, uh, ministries of education. So that let them let the five compete, so that who is better will 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 shine. And competition is the way to improve fast and to open the mindset of Singaporeans. I, I, I think the important uh, challenge that we have in Singapore is that Singaporeans must participate in direct democracy. They must be directly involved in the shaping of their own living conditions, right? And, and that's the, the whole idea of the five uh, uh, elected, elected uh, local governments, right? Uh, who's going to who's going to do this? Who's going to make this happen? I don't know, but this is the challenge which Singapore has to has to undertake. Now, let me give you a few uh, concrete examples of some of the ideas that uh, uh, we have. So, at the at the district level, local government; at the institutional level, all the universities, polytechnics, and institutes of technical education should become hundred percent live-in campuses. So that the students don't have to travel, they spend two hours traveling uh, back and forth from their home to the to the campus, right? And when they go home, they are under the thumb of mother, right? <laughs> That's not a way to to develop the kind of uh, initiative and imaginative uh, uh, sense of, uh, of of free enterprise among the 
among the students, right? Because when they live and learn together, they develop their, their minds very, very much. And I had a meeting. This is my meeting with uh, the former Minister of Education, uh, Mr. Ong Yi Kang, right? Who agreed with me that we should we should have 100% live in campuses. The question is the cost, right? So these are my students who worked with me and we developed the idea of using shipping containers. This is a 20 foot shipping container with a, a divided into two students on one side and another student on the other side with a shared toilet and, and, and bathroom toilet in the center, right? And um, we can do this, we can, do, we can achieve this in, in clusters, right? And uh, we can achieve, we can produce, uh, we can reduce the rent down to $100 a month. Right now, the, the typical campus uh, dorm, dormitory is $500 to $600 a month, which is uh, expensive and also in limited supply. Only 10% of the campus students can, uh, can be allowed to live even only for one year in a campus, right? I, I want to have uh, uh, students living in campus throughout the entire campus life, okay? Now, uh, the minister told me he agrees with it. He sent the instruction down to the uh, request down to the university, and the university had a meeting with me. The university agreed. The matter was uh, transferred to the to the Department of uh, Real Estate, right? Who then employed a, 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 a qualified quantity surveyor to evaluate whether the cost of the uh, using shipping containers would be uh, a lot cheaper than a building ordinarily, right? And the conclusion was um, it, it cannot because once you have, once the, the quantity surveyor and the professionals involved applied the, the building control rules to the use of shipping containers, uh, um, it was found to be uh, not as cost effective as uh, we had claimed, right? And yet, of course, there are thousands of container student housing in Germany and Holland and all over Europe, right? But because our rules in Singapore say that we 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 have to have different uh, higher standards, you know, fire protection, all the steel must be clad in concrete and, and so on and so forth. And so therefore, uh, the rules, when you apply the rules, it, it makes it uh, uneconomic, right? So the question now is, how are we going to change this? And who is going to change this? So to recap again, the big picture is we have to have direct democracy at the at the district level. Then at the universities, we must have uh, 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 housing for all the students so that the, the, the development of the, the other capacities besides the scholastics will, will, will go up, right? So entrepreneurship is crucial. And how to foster this fast? So I, I together with my... Um, uh, other colleagues, we propose th that we start with the the uh, the Nanyang Technical University campus, which is the 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 most uh developed uh, technical university in Singapore, and they have a huge number of uh, very progressive uh, professors, right, who have accumulated large num large amounts of uh uh, uh patents, right, and so on, right, and uh, if we can start with the we can succeed in NTU then all the other campuses can also be, be changed, right? So this is the enterprise campus, right? Uh, the existing uh, population is 40,000. I want to increase it to 80,000 so that uh, a lot of startup businesses will be able to uh, fit, uh, fit into the ecosystem of an uh, of, of, uh, innovative university. The professors will be involved in startup businesses. The students will be interning and so on. So this is how we can create a whole new uh, environment. And why is that possible? Because university land is, is, uh, is not commercial land. And therefore, the land cost is almost zero, right? Therefore, startup businesses and, and, and small uh, enterprises can, uh, can be co-located within campuses, right? Young families can even live in the, in the, in the, in the, camp, in the campus, right? At a housing costs which are... No, one third the, the, the current housing cost, which means that you can create a very innovative uh, entrepreneurial environment, right? Starting from, from the university campus. 
I had this idea about uh, how do how do we change the education system? If you start off, we must do both, right? Uh, uh, changing education system in the school system as well as at the higher education system. In the school system, if you want to, if we make, if we are effective in making changes, it will take at least eighteen years. But in the uh, higher education, if we effectively do what we propose, right? you can change it within 10 years. So this is a very fundamental shift of priority, right? In other words, the whole of Singapore can become an enterprise city within 10 years, okay? And that's that's already stretching the time, right? Because I think we need to do it even faster, right? Now, for those who are interested in this, go to this uh, uh, YouTube uh, video. Uh, just, just take a photograph of this, right? And we have an eight-minute uh, uh, video on how this uh, enterprise campus can be can be actualized. Okay. Now we now have to think about the region, right? This is the the situation we are in, right? Uh, <laughs> the conflict between the U.S. and China, right? And and unless we uh, are able to become strong in our own right, right? That means we develop a strong eco regional. Uh, uh, mutual benefit economy, right? We will be caught in between these two, right? So let's let's the 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 next part of my discussion is how do we do that? How do we become a strong uh, eco regional economy, right? Across existing political boundaries, right? And and uh, across uh, uh, different cultural zones and so on and so forth. So this is the the challenge. So how can Singapore? strengthen ASEAN by proactively playing a catalytic role in finance, we have the money. Investment, bring, we can bring the investment in, right? Cultural exchange, technological transfer, infrastructure investment, right? Environmental remediation, and distance learning, education, and healthcare. All of this can be done, right? Over the, within the, in the, in the next 10 years, right? So these are some of the projects which I want to suggest, right? Number one, establish an ASEAN University campus in Johor, which is next to Singapore. Land is cheaper, right? Uh, the living cost is much lower than Singapore, right? ASEAN people can, can easily live and learn in, in, together with Singaporeans in Johor, right? And we can run semester programs right, for top Southeast Asian universities and students to live and learn together. This is the foundation for future co cooperation. Friendship is the most important ingredient in regional cooperation. Okay, so this is the kind of thing, right? Uh, this is a, a model of a modular city, right? One kilometer by one kilometer, which I had uh, worked with my students, right? Uh, uh, we can house 100,000 people here, right? And uh, we can adapt this model into the, the university campus. We can have 100,000 people living and learning together. The center part is where all the the research labs and 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 uh, uh, workshops and uh, technical uh, facilities are in the center, right? Uh, the the red area around the 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 uh, the middle is where the which I call the in the, the 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 central nervous system. That's where all the teaching rooms, the 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 the, the art museums, the uh, lecture halls, the the student hostels. The uh, community functions, the, the the commercial functions, the shopping and and areas and all of this will be uh, uh, strung together, right, in a contiguous manner, so that uh, as people go about the routines of their everyday life, going to, to school, going to to work and so on, they will meet each other and 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 form friendships. So this is the the idea, okay. No, so living, learning, and earning together. Uh, and innovating together builds the mutual future, right? So Johor could very well be a very important spot, a starting point, right? Okay. Now the other very important uh, a proposal that, uh, that that I'm involved in, and, and I, I want to expand this, is 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 what I call track to dip diplomacy. This is a, a group called Asian Dialogue Society of which I'm a member, right? Uh, you have. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim, right? You have a uh, uh, um, um, uh, chief editor of the Bangkok uh, Post. You have Surin Pitsuwan, who used to be the uh, uh, Secretary General of ASEAN, right? 
You have another another person there who is an academic from 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 Tokyo, right? You have uh, an, another intellectual from Vietnam, and so on. So this is a group that discusses uh, a lot of uh, uh, strategic issues, right? Uh, in the whole of Asia, right? And it and it has a, a kind of corresponding membership of about a uh, uh, hundred uh, intellectuals stretching from Turkey all the way to 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 Japan, right? Including China, India, and uh, Southeast Asia. So this is a dialogue group that uh, that that generates ideas and 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 feeds ideas up the up to tier one, right? The tier one are the are the policy makers. Okay. Now this is a picture of uh, me meeting with uh, the Thai intellectual uh, Thai Kwan Trung and uh, and and Mr. Surin Pitsuwan. Unfortunately, Surin passed away. He used to be the Secretary General of ASEAN. And, and at this meeting, uh, uh, Surin asked the important question. What are you going to do? What, what needs to be done for 450 million poor people in ASEAN? Because if we do not do anything uh, positive to upgrade, the, to, re, to, to, to end their poverty and their backwardness, right? we are going to have a whole host of social, pro, uh, social, social and political problems. right? So, so this is this I, this challenge led me to think about the necessity of a rural urban uh, re, re, to resolve the rural urban dichotomy. Right now, all the resources are going to the big cities, and the countryside is neglected. So this is the problem, right? Um, we are not starting from scratch because uh, there already exists uh, a thinking within ASEAN. Right, and this is a map produced by the uh, uh, the three economic zones proposed by a Japanese-funded economic research institute uh, based in Jakarta, right? Uh, in which uh, uh, the, shall we call it the continental uh, 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 ASEAN, right? Which is uh, the uh, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam. Uh, uh, Burma, Myanmar, and so on, and then of course the 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 area which of great interest is the the intermediate zone that is Malaysia, Sumatra, Singapore, right, and then the the insular Southeast Asia, right, uh, uh Kalimantan, uh, Java, Philippines, uh, and 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 right all, right across until uh, Iran Jaya. So these are the three economic zones. They have very different uh. Uh, political and economic uh, challenges, and we must address them. Okay, so these three uh, economic zones have already been envisaged by the Japanese-funded Economic Research Institute for ASEAN, based in Jakarta. Right on top of that, that there's a there has been since uh, 2017 the ASEAN Power Summit. Right about how do we link together the power grid of the whole of ASEAN? Right. And this is a very important uh, uh, issue, which has to do with climate change. How do we change the the uh, how do we how do we decarbonize the the entire energy system of ASEAN? So this is an ongoing discussion, right? And and it 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 goes way beyond ASEAN, right? It includes India. It, it goes across right over to China, even to Mongolia. So this is the kind of uh, uh, the Asia Pacific kind of dialogue that that is actually happening. But in the Southeast Asian area, this is the, 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 the Southeast Asian grid, right? You'll notice, for example, there is a, a, a link between uh, uh, Kalimantan and, and, and Malaysia, right? This is the, from the Bakun Dam, uh, uh, huge, it's a huge uh, uh, hydroelectric plant, right? It's to, it's to, it's to support the, the energy requirements of Sumatra and, and as well as uh, uh, Peninsular Malaysia. Now, now, the issue is, yes, we have energy, we have the, we have the institutional structure, ASEAN, right? How do we uh, network the urbanization and, and network the economy, right? Uh, with Singapore as the catalyst for, for this, right? With, with China coming in with the Belt and Road Initiative, right? So this is the, the kind of picture, right? I don't think we can avoid this, right? ASEAN and China have to have this handshake. Right, um, but unless ASEAN develops its own uh, economic strength, right, 
its its bargaining position, its uh, its relationship with China will be much better if it has uh, its own economic strength. And this is the argument for uh, eco regional uh, uh, mutual benefit uh, economy. So that's the important thing, right? Because the Belt and Road Initiative by China, whether we like it or not, they are pushing it, right? And if you if we are weak, well, you will just be uh, uh, subject to its imperatives, right? Okay. So what does it uh, geographically mean, right? So I I think that for the start, Singapore, Johor, and Sumatra will have to be the starting economic area, right? So this is it. This is Malacca. This is Johor. This is Singapore. This is Batam and Bintang, right? And uh, and uh, and a uh, uh, a bridge or a, or a sea lane connecting over to Sumatra, right? And then back over here. This is the bridge between uh, Rupat Island and Malacca, which is uh, already proposed by, by China because China is interested in, in the economic uh, and uh, uh, material resources of, of the whole of Sumatra, which is enormous, right? So this is an area of at least 45 million people, right? Uh, when Singaporeans worry about you know, the 10 million projection in Singapore, that's nothing compared to the 45 million, right? And this would mean a whole development of, 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 of lots of, of new towns and new, uh, uh, I call it rural urban settlements and a whole new regional economy, right? So this is the future, the immediate future. And from here, we will expand outwards. So rural urbanization means that you we can have uh, organized the the, the 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 living patterns from its present scattered form right into uh, uh, clustered forms right in which are surrounded by farms right and linked together right but that's not enough right what is important is to, is is the economic relationship between the countryside and the cities right right so we'll talk about that uh, in in a in a little bit right. When I proposed these ideas, uh, this was my meeting in uh, in uh, in Vietnam, in Hue, in which the the People's Committee completely adopted the idea of rural urbanization and actually assigned uh, pieces of land for me to develop. Right? Of course, I'm not a developer, but uh, it it shows how how committed they are to the idea of resolving the rural urban dichotomy. Okay, right. And 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 then of course I also was asked by brief to brief uh, the 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 uh, An Anwar's party right. This is Anwar's daughter Nuru Iza on on rural uh, urbanization right. So this is a these are not new things. And of course I also was introduced to uh, the madam in in Myanmar right. And she said to me focus on the villages right. Not just villages but villagers as well. So the people as well as the farm as well as the, the settlement. So these are fundamental ideas that are floating around in Southeast Asia. We must deal with the 450 million poor people. If we cannot, then we are going to face a lot of trouble. Okay. Now, the idea of e-commerce uh, linking the, uh, re the regional, rural, and urban economies. This is my student, right? My, my China student who took my ideas about rural urbanization and developed a, a project in South, Southwest China, right? He gave a, a laptop to the local uh, uh, shopkeeper who immediately used it to develop uh, uh, a sales program of, his, of his, villages, his village products, right? To the nearby cities, right? He was very successful. Uh, Jack Ma, this picture is 10 years old. Jack Ma heard about it, came here, met with him and um, immediately said to my student that uh, he's going to start 500 uh, uh, villages straight away. And that has now grown into Alibaba and uh, and also Tencent, which is also part of Alibaba, right? And they control the whole uh, uh, e-commerce business in the whole of China. So this is the, the beginning, right? So e-commerce is the way in which the rural and the urban economies can coordinate, right? However, there is a, uh, <clears throat> but, but there are other issues, right? Climate change will drive the eco-regional economy and, and, and technology as well. And Singapore can be a major facilitator, right? 
So, so technology investment, right? Uh, rural urban uh, uh, integration, right? Uh, uh, and, and so they are. They, it's a very complex mix of issues, right? Which have to take place concurrently. Now, this is, for example, another energy uh, uh, project by by a good friend of mine uh, about how do we use the low wind speed in the tropics, right? One point five meter per second to generate electricity, right? So this is a uh, 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 Andrew Vass, a uh, 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 multiple uh, uh, in inventor uh, of uh, 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 new technology in 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 in. In, in Singapore, unfortunately, his ideas are rejected in Singapore, and this is <laughs> this is uh, Professor Chan Siu Hua, right, who is uh, considered as the world's expert on hydrogen, right, and he has proposed that we will use uh, Singapore's oil oil base uh, to turn uh, the oil industry into an ally uh, and not an enemy, right, by extracting hydrogen from fossil fuel. Not only hydrogen, but the but the, the synthetic carbon as well, because synthetic carbon is going to be a major uh, 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 element in the in the in the making of new batteries and new uh, 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 computer chips. So this is going to be a very important uh, transformation of of hydrocarbons into clean energy and uh, and sustainable uh, technology. Okay. Now the other very major important thing that we need to do is to is to invest in uh, uh, in, in 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 bamboo instead of using trees, cutting down trees for toilet paper. That's a that's a crime, right? So these are the things that that we need to do. Okay. Now, the Singapore Johor e-commerce city to countryside, right? I I just don't I I'm not just a theoretician, right? I actually am involved in in a project with uh, village people in Johor, right? To set up um. Uh, these are kampong friends in Johor, right? Uh, planning how to produce uh, uh, kampong products which can be sold in Singapore, right? And and also uh, Singapore products can be sold in the kampongs. So this is a kind of rural to urban, urban to rural uh, 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 economic uh, uh, things. So this is a typical uh, uh, Felda uh, development, right? Felda is the uh, 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 rural development, plantation development, uh, started in Malaysia uh, since the 1960s, right? But but as but because uh, the the of the aging of the of the planters, right? They they not, they now need a new kind of economic uh, driver to 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 to, to, to use the infrastructure into a, a a different economy. Now, how can this economy, you know, how can these people, for example, rural people, right? Uh, my 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 wife, for example, buys uh, very interesting uh, uh products from rural areas in in Taiwan, right? Because there's e-commerce, these people can sell their products by e-commerce, right? All all over the world, right? So in other words, the possibility of a of a, a rural kampong economy, right, linked to the world by e-commerce is a is a real possibility. Poverty does not have to be uh uh, uh stagnated within the uh, 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 rural areas, right? So, for example, this is a uh, rural uh, cooperative producing uh, coffee in Sumatra, right? Now, village products can reach a global market via e-commerce, but needs good transportation. This is the problem, all right? Uh, I I went to Java we, we, uh, with a big, very big developer, right? And we 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 travel all over all over Java. Right, the road systems are terrible, right? And therefore, how can you improve the the economic uh, uh, potential of the rural people without without good transportation? And transportation need, need, needs a lot of capital investment, and the capital is very very short in short supply, right? So vertical uh, uh, transportation, this is the, the the kind of technology that we must have, right? Uh, this is a cargo VTR, vertical takeoff and landing system, right? Uh, it can be. Uh, it's not a new technology. It's it's been been uh, around since nineteen sixties. But now the engines are much better, and and uh, the technology is much better, right? We can do it, right? So this is my own design for 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 Indonesia, right? 
What does it mean to have transportation of this kind? For example, Singapore to Batam in 10 minutes. Singapore, right now it's one hour by boat. Singapore to Batu Pahat or Singapore to Moa or, or Pontian or whatever, right? And then connecting all over the small towns and villages, right? 17,000 islands in Indonesia can be easily connected by, by, by VTOL. You don't, need, you don't need runways, you don't need airports, right? You can land on any, any school field or, or, or open space. So this is the, the, the importance of, of VTOL, right? And, it, and if VTOL aircraft run on hydrogen, right? It can be also a very clean energy, right? So this is a typical, a very, very important challenge. And Singapore is an ideal place to manufacture all this kind of technology, right? Okay, so this is the topic of, of a much different discussion. With this kind of technology, it means all the beautiful areas in the whole of Southeast Asia, in the mountains, in the villages, in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the rural areas, in the forests, in the beaches, right, which are not accessible, become accessible. Therefore, ecotourism becomes a major part of the local economy, only possible because of VTOL, okay? So Singapore is an ideal place to manufacture VTOL aircraft. We, uh, we should set up industrial cooperatives and so on. So where's the money coming from? Money is not a problem, right? Technology and and management and, 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 and te technological capability is the problem. Unless you have, you train a whole new generation of, of, of bold, courageous and innovative young people, right? Money is no use, right? But money is a very huge possibility, right? So we can do this. Copy the Mondragon model in, in Spain, right? And Mondragon is a very successful uh, uh, cooperative that is able to uh, employ all its people, right? They have their own universities, they have their own banks, they, and, and, and they have their own factories and so on and so forth. They have their own research uh, institutions and so on. And, and they are... And, 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 it's owned by all the workers. So this is the kind of new economy that is that that we can have, right? It does not mean that you replace the, the corporate capitalist model, right? But I'm saying that it's possible to have a, to have coexistence between different economic models, right? Within the same uh, system, right? Now, rural education, healthcare opportunities in the region very important, right? You cannot have a uh, 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 economic development without improving the quality of, of the health of people, the education, right? So, for example, this is a project which I, I did in, in Thailand, in the poorest area of Thailand, together with Michai, right? It's, a, it's the Michai Bamboo School, right? It's 150 students. We, this is in its 15th year. Uh, it, it is considered by uh, you, uh, uh, what, uh, what is it, Unido? What is it, Unido? Who came and one of the UN uh, missions came, spent a month studying the school and declared that it is the most uh, uh, advanced and successful rural school in the world. Okay. So it's from there that you can run telemedicine, right? All right. We, we, with, with Singapore and the regional uh, uh, health systems, we can, we can communicate, right? We can set up all these uh, uh, portable uh, uh, Clinics which are certified uh, by by health authorities and so on, right? And the cultural question is this: Why must we always have fast life? Why shouldn't we also have slow life? Right? Slow life is also a, a way of life, but it must be viable, right? So the economic uh, uh, potential of the rural areas must also be enhanced so that the slow life can happen, right? But a fast life also important right so what is the fast life for mainly for young people young people who want to go to cities with bright lights and excitement right uh, older people right retired people they want a quieter life okay so what is the role of big cities like singapore there are only five rules right six rules right to be the center for the highest level of medical research and treatment of course to be the center for the highest levels of technological research and innovation and education. Centers for the highest levels of academic research and education. Centers for the highest levels of me media production, right? Right. 
centers for the highest levels of cultural development and production, centers for the highest level of financial management and international relations. So this is the only function, these are the functions. Everything else can be decentralized, right? Particularly with uh, uh, high-tech uh, robotics and so on. You can decentralize everything, provided there's good energy, there's good uh, 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 sustainable energy, uh, uh, transportation of goods from, from production to, from the production places to the consumption places and vice versa, right? And, and there's good health and good education for the people in that area. So these are the, 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 the overarching uh, considerations, right? So the future has to be a combination of physical infrastructure and the, the development of multiple human intelligences. The question is how and by who, that's the problem. So we need to have regional visionary leaders to inspire this, but who are these, right? Anwar Ibrahim, right? Anwar's Madani concept, right? So it's about sustainability, Prosperity, innovation, respect, trust, and compassion across the board, across the races, across the rural to urban uh, dichotomy, right? So these are the, the concepts that are important, right? We need visionary leaders like him, right? And there's, of course, Jokowi, right? right? The president of uh, Widodo wrote in his vision and tells the Indonesian dream 2015 to 2085, right? Indonesian human resources whose intelligence outperforms other nations in the world. Wow, that's his claim. Indonesian people who uphold pluralism, culture, re religious, and uphold ethical values. Indonesia is the center of education, technology, and world civilization. That's a great ambition, right? Society and government apparatus are free from corruption. That's another great aspiration equitable infrastructure development throughout Indonesia. Indonesia as an independent and free country and one of the most influential in the Asia Pacific. You, you, you remember Asia Pacific, right? Not Indo-Pacific, Asia Pacific. Indonesia as a benchmark example of world economic growth. All of this is basically saying the challenge to Southeast Asia and to Asia as a whole is to, is to evolve and to develop a new Asia, a, new, a different model from the Western uh, model, which is based on, on uh, 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 production and consumption, hyper-consumption, -con right? Uh, which is not a, a, a very good thing, a breakdown of families, the, the loss of uh, uh, total uh, uh, fertility, uh, 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 re reproduction, and so on. These are the Asian Asia Asia has to resolve these 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 issues, right? And of course, uh, we have uh, people like uh, George Yeo, right? That cities are built on trust. Important is trust, human relationships. In Southeast Asia, we have a hundred ways of saying no without, without saying no, right? <laughs> In fact, we should never say no because it is impolite. But the ability to sense this nuance is so important. Cities are therefore not just nodes of trust, they are nodes for networking of trust. So this is the point, you see, the ASEAN University concept, the, 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 reach, the opening of the, of, the, of the young Singaporean mind and so on are very much part of this, right? So I end with this question, right? So George Yeo is a, is a roving intellectual statesman. People ask him whether he should be the president or he should become the prime minister. I, I think his answer is no, because he's, he's too big for that, right? His role is, is, is pan-Asian, okay? And then of course, we have the new generation of uh, young leaders, right? The so-called fourth generation, people like Lawrence Wong, uh, a, a, a decent guy, a good guy, right? But does he have the, the kind of will? Does he have the kind of vision? That's the kind of thing we, must, we have to challenge them, right? And he says, I want to see a Singapore where opportunities are open to all, no matter who they are or what their background is, where every man and woman is valued, every child treasured, and every senior respected. Very good values, right? But the question is that, how are you going to achieve the economy and the, and the uh, 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 financial system that will make this a, a, a reality, right? So this is the challenge we must throw to the fourth generation of Singapore leaders whether they are PAP or any other 
leadership. I don't care, right? The fourth generation of Singapore leaders must be able to raise the morale of Singaporeans, have courage and creative drive to move Singapore and the region to a new eco-regional future for all our mutual uh, neighbors and for our mutual survival within the complex world that we are facing. Thank you. I'm open for discussion now. Uh, thank you, Prof. Day, for this most uh, interesting uh, speak uh, talk. Um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our first commentator, uh, Mr. Yusmadi Yusof. He's a Malaysian lawyer. Uh, in his own firm, he has he was a former member of Parliament in Malaysia from two thousand eight to twenty thirteen. He's a partner at Fada No and Yusmadi, and the founding chairman of Rights Foundation. It's an independent think tank and charity organization focusing on regional governance, human rights, and social justice initiatives. Uh, Mr. Yusmadi is also a political aide to Anwar Ibrahim, Malaysia's current prime minister. So, uh, Yusmadi, uh, can you hear us? Yes. Eldrin, Eldrin. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yes. Okay, take it away, Yusmadi. Floor is yours. All right. Uh, uh... First of all, thank you, Alfred, uh, and thank you, Professor, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, listening to what uh, Prof said for the previous uh, hours, I think, uh, first of all, we have to acknowledge that uh, um, Singapore region, uh, Malaysia-Singapore uh, relationship, uh, we are living in, 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 in the uh, 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 current existing uh, so-called uh, uh, frame. I use the word uh, uh, framework, so to speak. When I say framework in a very uh, a loose term, uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, to, 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 to respond to what a professor envisioned that uh, the new kind of relationship, the new kind of collaboration, the new kind of even humanity uh, among the, the people of uh, the two countries and the region uh, uh, to to be to be to be espoused in the future. I think we need new vision. First of all, the the new vision. I agree with him. Uh, it has to be one uh, visionary uh, leader, and that leader must have a very strong uh, moral standing. Because uh, when dealing with people, I think that that person uh, uh, must have a certain uh, 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 I would say uh, ethical uh, standing. And uh, uh, a few names that he mentioned just now, I think I can easily agree uh, uh, by process. You know, someone like Anwar Ibrahim, he was a properly elected. Uh, even before he was elected, he, he, he has the legitimacy of the people, not only in Malaysia, but I, 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 I can simply say also in the region that reflect in his previous activism and also uh, his current continuous engagement with the uh, uh, neighboring country. And, and when coming to Malaysia and uh, Malaysia and Singapore, I think uh, I've seen that uh, his relationship uh, with uh, uh, Singapore counterpart, uh, Indonesian counterpart, uh, even uh, Thailand is beyond politics. So we need someone who, who, who can also assert the uh, relationship beyond politics. That's not point number two. Point number three, I think uh, I agree with Prof as well. Uh, uh, the, the relationship has to be... Uh, also about uh, 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 urgent uh, challenges. I, I give, for example, uh, as a start, for example, education. Of course, uh, now I have to congratulate Singapore and US now become top uh, ranking, maybe top 10, top 5, or maybe top 10 now uh, in the world. So, uh, But uh, at the same time, uh, I know how uh, someone like me, someone like uh, many leaders, many core competence from Malaysia, Benefits uh, from uh, uh, LKY program and US program and TU program in Singapore, and I can I also agree with Professor that how that model is supposed to be regionalized in the name of uh, uh, ASEAN uh, University. Uh, of course, currently what they are having is ASEAN Network University, something like the Aramis, uh, the one uh, they are having in Europe. But what I think uh, Professor proposed, which I I concur, I agree. You, you need to put everyone together so that they interact among themselves. They, 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 they talk among themselves. And more importantly, what we you used to say, being a hostel boy, 
where you eat together, you know, you eat together, you joke together. You, you need that kind of generation for the region. So I agree with the proposal of the ASEAN University. But, uh, Professor, I think your idea about Mondragon uh, has to be regionalized. So I don't know how, how you, we're going to do it uh, between uh, countries. Uh, I think ASEAN should, should, should uh, propose a, a collaborative, a cooperative uh, enterprise. Uh, I don't know whether it makes sense or not, but I know all this while people are talking about city charter, people are talking about uh, 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 sometimes you don't even have to amend the constitution. You just need to uh, between parties, between institutions to agree on certain charter. What, what are the charter? So I think uh, in the small scale, what is cooperative about? Cooperative have their own internal constitution, their own internal charter. We also agree among members. And I think if that can be espoused at that regional level, uh, we can see something measurable. Uh, for example, uh, Prof uh, highlighted about Felda. Uh, accidentally, I'm currently leading uh, one of a uh, major uh, Felda subsidiary called ANCOP, uh, which uh, was uh, designed by Felda uh, in order to be the builder. So when, when Prof was talking about how Felda has survived the first phase, which is poverty eradication, now they are going to the second phase, which is uh, about uh, uh, what you call it, uh, quality, uh, quality of life. So maybe by 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 instilling the idea of urbanization, it may address the challenge the, the challenges of uh, the divide between rural and urban, uh, where we can create more urban space. Uh, the uh, in between, say for example, in between uh, uh, Pahang, for example, like Tioman, oh no, from Rompin to to Kuantan. In between, you must have a few urban space so that uh, whoever in the countryside can self-sustain economically. Uh, and my last point uh, 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 for, for this session is this. Uh, we need also to nurture a new idea of friendship uh, between countries because uh, what Prof benefits from the Asian Dialogue Society was a, a, a what I call it a fellowship of friends, uh, whereby a group of scholars in the region uh, have a very loose, uh, not very high, high hierarchical, uh, structured kind of association. But what they achieve, I have to say, for the last twenty years, uh, something uh, very, very, very uh, impressive, and uh, something we I, I want to share to the audience. Anwar Ibrahim himself was among a few who who. Uh, preemptively uh, uh, built the foundation for the admission of Vietnam, for example. Uh, so, so, so uh, I have a good news for for the audience today. Let's prepare this foundation because by year twenty twenty five, Anwar Ibrahim uh, going to be the chairman of ASEAN. And I think uh, compared to what Surin has done as a secretary general, uh, Anwar may have more leverage as a prime minister and also the chairman of ASEAN uh, in twenty twenty five. So whatever we have discussed today, I think uh, must uh, end uh, uh, into a few initiatives. I think number one, of course, I, I, I agree with the ASEAN University. Number two, I agree with the, the cooperative, but I, I just want it to make it more regional. And number three, of course, I, I would like to experiment. This I, I use the word experiment is uh, those days, uh, scholar like Hamka, for example, from Indonesia is embraced by Malaysian, not as Indonesian scholar. But as Malaysian scholar, we uh, we don't see him as an Indonesian uh, ulama. No, he is a Malaysian. So what I'm trying to tell you is this: we need a, another, uh, I don't know what you call individual or structure, which I'm offering. I want to do experiment with the mall because I know that uh, after monastery, after university, after parliaments, I see mall has a potential where uh, people of the region uh, can in, meet, interact, and collaborate. So it may be a movement of malls, and I know Singapore are very good in doing malls apart from universities. Uh, uh, what else I want to say? Uh, my concluding remark, Prof, whatever we do, it has to be something very enlightened. So the challenge of Madani, Prof, today, uh, as much as I think uh, it has a potential to, to, to be regionalized and to be internationalized, but currently Madani become very parochial. It's only been celebrated by Malaysian and also Indonesian. Um, in 1995, when Anwar Ibrahim espoused the idea of Masyarakat Madani in uh, Mos Istidlal, Indonesia, the idea flourished and someone like Nukolis Majid 
and a few other scholars of Indonesia had developed it. That's why, uh, but in Malaysia, it was not well developed because uh, immediately after that, in 1998, Anna was put in jail. So it has no chance to, to truly develop the idea. So the idea now evolved from Masyarakat Madani, Madani society, which means very much how a, a society, we have a strong moral foundation. It, uh, the moral source can be from religion, can be from culture. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, very vibrant, uh, respect among each other. So uh, the current idea of Madani that Anna espoused, the main challenge uh, for me, uh, it has to be very universal. It cannot be parochial and it has to be enlightened as well. So I think uh, I encourage uh, my fellow friend from uh, Singapore, from the region, and now I, I, we have a listener from uh, uh, from America as well. Uh, uh, Mark, maybe you can suggest, because for me, uh, Madani now currently stand a very strong uh, pillars. For example, sustainability, uh, respect, uh, care and compassion, which I know very much missing not only in the region, but also in the international diplomacy. Trust, right? and also he has a, the, the technological and innovative element as well, to uh, stand on the ground of innovation. So, uh, Prof, I think uh, beyond the circle, we need also to get uh, the, the business group, we need to get the, the gov uh, governmental group, and also uh, establish uh, civil society. For example, uh, I just cite example which come to my mind is for example like Muhammadiyah in Indonesia. They have a 50 million members of more than 170 universities, more than 120 hospitals. I think they are very big. And uh, Nadatul Ulama, very democratic, uh, they're not underground organization, very vibrant civil society, and more importantly, politically very influential. So I think uh, sometimes we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Maybe it's a question of uh, a showcasing certain uh, local uh, dose, local good story to the regional level so that more importantly, we can learn from each other to create better understanding. That, that is my, my, my take, Ron. Okay, thank you, uh, Yusmadi, for your comments. Uh, Prof, do you want to respond to Yusmadi or should I go on to another commentator? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Yusmadi. I think uh, you, you have... Uh, uh, summarize your position very very clearly, and uh, it it gives us a lot of a lot of uh, encouragement that uh, that that uh, actually what we are trying to do in in Friday conversations right actually uh, this idea just came just popped into my head that we are we actually should develop into a track track two organization right because it is true the kind of uh, uh, public participation and a uh, 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 link up of people across the region and even the world, right? That new ideas, right, can be formulated, which have an impact on the policy level. That track one, right? So I think the kind of discussion that we we ought to to to, to work towards is actually a track track two level of discussion. In other words, we 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 take the idea of the Asian Dialogue Society and make it much larger. <laughs> uh, prof, yeah. a small small uh, addition. Uh, what what tactically as well, we cannot make uh, the idea like as if it's a ready made idea. The the, yeah. the, the, the the way I say it is this: I know uh, for such a visionary leader like Anwar to be effective as an ASEAN chairman or whatsoever, the foundation need to be built now. That's so right. what what the Asian Dialogue Society been doing with the idea of shared destiny before? Yeah. It, it was uh, uh, towards uh, making the Surin Peace One. <clears throat> Uh, yeah. become very active uh, Secretary General of ASEAN. So I Absolutely. think uh, yeah. you are very... So what, what you guys have been doing, this Friday conversation has to be regionalized. So let's start yes. uh, more vigorous with Malaysia. I, I yeah. encourage uh, this conversation. Uh, we'll yeah. get more participation from uh, yeah. my, my dear friend from Malaysia as well. Yeah. And and, 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 and Zoom is a very useful uh, medium for, for this kind of thing because otherwise traveling distances and, 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 and make it very difficult to meet, you see, right? And and with Zoom, we can we can cross boundaries all over the place. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Over to you, uh, Alfred. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to call on uh, Miss Hani Mohammad. Uh, just give me a second to. Uh, hopefully, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Miss uh, Moham Miss Hani is uh, formerly a lecturer at Monash and Murdoch University. Uh, she is the current CEO and founder of Alertis a private consultancy which she founded in 2012 
that organizes interfaith, geopolitics, and peace building conferences and hold dialogues globally. So uh, I'll pass the time now to Ms. Honey. Honey, over to you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, Prof Tay. Uh, very enlightening uh, presentation earlier. Um, and uh, thanks also, Yusmadi, I mean, whom I've met uh, you know, a few months back uh, for uh, your uh, you know, uh, thoughts and views. Uh, so Prof has um, asked me to touch a little bit more on the uh, race, religion, culture issues. Um, and I think, um, you know, like what uh, Prof T has spoken about, uh, setting that infrastructure, the connectability between ASEAN, um, you know, having that transport, you know, that will allow like without runway for, um, you know, better, uh, you know, movements uh, between country is really good. Um, and the importance of, um, you know, uh, having an interfaith, having a peaceful society, um, is so that, you know, economy um, can progress. You know, a lot of people think that, oh, okay, you know, interfaith dialogues, um, you know, security, it's not really um, too important, but without um, peace, uh, nothing else can actually um, proceed. Um, so, um, and, and uh, when we do this sort of dialogues, um, the importance is also to have that authenticity and also to ensure that it is organic. You know, it is just not about having a PR or publicity stunt. It has to be done at the grassroots level, you know, the um, uh, uh, social cohesion uh, needs to be uh, there between the Indians, the Muslims, the Eurasians, you know, uh, uh, the Jewish, whatever, uh, you know, uh, uh, faith-based uh, 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 organization there is. For example, I, I'll draw this uh, one um, incident of the Gaza war. Um, you know, it may actually spark a lot of um, controversy. So um, the understanding of, um, you know, the context of the war, the history, uh, the politics of it is really important. Right. And uh, once um, that has been uh, set, then I guess, um, you know, that you won't have like a Muslim Jewish um, arguments like, uh, you know, we haven't heard any of that, for example. I mean, of course, there is support, um, you know, from Malaysia, or Indonesia for Gaza, but we do not see like any real violence, you know, unlike in Sri Lanka and all this where, you know, there's serious, you know, ethnic and religious violence to the point that, you know, um, uh, religious uh, 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 worship places get bombed and things like that. So, um, so these are like really, really pertinent. And uh, also I think um, it's important for the state and government to ensure that, uh, you know, I, I hear this being regurgitated a lot by current politician. Uh, they say that regardless of political affiliation, um, you know, they, they do want to recognize like all Singaporeans because everyone is also a taxpayer. But I'd like to see it, um, that they do walk the talk and ensure that uh, not just those who are like pro a certain party that were given uh, you know a space but also to invite Singaporeans of uh, regardless of political affiliations to quote their word to actually come and join in um, you know uh, to build Singapore uh, towards this um, you know like a peaceful uh, state and uh, then my final point uh, would be uh, besides just religion and culture uh, sorry religion and uh, race I think culture is also also equally important um, and uh, because you know um, sometimes when you talk about theoretical matters uh, there are some fault lines and differences so using culture is a little bit more um, beautiful you know like for example like Southeast Asian are coming together to propose to UNESCO to make the kabaya as a uh, you know a traditional uh, uh, clothing and I think uh, that sort of made Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore speak more doing, uh, you know, collaborative um, exhibition. Um, and I think these are very healthy things. And also uh, music, sports, arts, you know, all these things cuts across, um, you know, the, the slightly more difficult and challenging topics. And for example, uh, maybe I just want to highlight a personal experience. I went to a jazz concert um, this last month or so. And it was supposed to be like uh, Jeremy Montero doing this um, jazz uh, uh, concert. And I was in 
invited and at the event itself, at the performance, two of them are actually Muslims, uh, Malays in Singapore. And I thought like, wow, like, you know, you have a Malay Muslim singing like Christmas songs, you know, and, and that's supposed to be that diversity and things that we're supposed to be celebrated. Uh, so I, I think on that note, um, I'll just um, end there, but uh, feel free to, uh, you know, bring up your comments or questions later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hani. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Mr. Tohan Shi. That's a great thing about uh, Zoom because we can have participants all over the world. Han Shi is actually based in Hong Kong. He's an independent writer uh, who used to work as a journalist uh, for South China Morning Post. And uh, he's a good friend of uh, <coughs> Friday Conversations. Uh, so I'll hand over the time now to Han Shi. Over to you, Han Great. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege uh, and a joy to join this seminar. I listened with very great interest to some of the points raised by Professor Tay King Soon and um, Honey as well. Um, um, I would like to uh, mention a few things. Um, one is Professor Tay King Soon talked a lot about e-commerce and also the need for transport infrastructure in Southeast Asia. I mean, what I've heard is that huge e Chinese e-commerce giants like Alibaba, they've done a great job in en enabling poor and humble farmers in the poorer parts of uh, rural China to sell their agricultural produce by e-commerce. And, um, you know, the Chinese government, that gave the Chinese government an incentive to build rural roads and rural infrastructure so that they can transport the goods to the cities. And um, there are some logistics firms, I think possibly perhaps involved, uh, affiliated with Alibaba as well as other firms that help transport all these goods uh, from, you know, the farmers in the poorer part and, the, and the, 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 the entrepreneurs in the poorer parts of China to the wealthiest cities in China. And for that, the Chinese government has, at one time at least, uh, is, has been very, very grateful to Alibaba for doing this. So I think this model can also be replicated in Southeast Asia where you can have e-commerce companies, um, you know, helping, um, you know, say durian producers export durians to China or to Singapore and have good in transport infrastructure to enable this. Uh, and then uh, Professor Tay King soon mentioned about the need for infrastructure, infrastructure which raises a very uh, interesting bugbear in me, uh, which is that, in my honest opinion, I think the only country right now that's capable of building lots of very good infrastructure in Southeast Asia and the world is China. Uh, so I completely agree that Southeast Asia can do with a lot more infrastructure because that helps you know, entrepreneurs sell their goods and it alleviates poverty in Southeast Asia and it raises standard of living in Southeast Asia. Uh, but the challenge is, as far as I can see, it's really China is the leading company for infrastructure, although you do have Japanese and Korean and French firms. And um, the, the terrible thing is that right now, America sees China as this very ugly demon, you know. Um, you know, American politicians like Hillary Clinton say China is a new imperialist and a new colonialist trying to make colonies and vassal states out of Africa and South, you know. And um, uh, Michael Pompeo says China is some creating some horrible debt traps full of corruption through their Belt and Road program throughout the world. And Michael Pence also said China is almost becoming an empire and it's also creating debt traps. So, um, but you know, in my honest opinion, I also I've, I spoke to a certain uh, infrastructure expert in a very a big Singapore sovereign wealth fund. I don't want to mention him because he didn't give me permission to quote him. But he told me that... Um, you know, America has has been a lot of talk, uh, but no action as far as infrastructure investment is concerned. Some time ago, uh, President Biden announced some multi billion dollar, I think it was sixty billion U.S. dollar, American infrastructure fund to compete with China's Belt and Road. But what my friend from this Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund told me is that, um, a lot of the money has not gone on the table, and you know, privately, African leaders are complaining that what Biden did was all talk and no action. So basically, to build infrastructure, I, I see that Southeast Asia cannot rely on America. It has to rely a lot on China. So there's a geopolitical challenge there. I mean, you know, Tay King so mentioned about China's hopes for Belt and Road connecting Malacca and Singapore and um, Riau and Sumatra. I mean, that's wonderful and I'm all for it. But America, my view, is great suspicion uh, since it passes the Straits of Malacca. 
So my hope is that the, the Southeast Asian leaders, including the Singapore leaders, have the wisdom um, not to let either America or China bully them. You know, we don't, Singapore and other Southeast Asian countries don't want America to punish them saying, oh, you know, you're siding with the Chinese regime and Belt and Road. We sanctioned China, and therefore we're also going to sanction you. I do not want to see that happen. I don't want China to become a pariah regime like Iran and anybody who does business with Iran is sanctioned by the America. I, I don't want that to happen when, you know, Southeast Asian countries turn to China, big Chinese e-commerce firms like Alibaba for e-commerce and um, Chinese infrastructure firms to build the roads, the ports, the sea bridges, etc. Um, and then, uh, you know, talking about poverty alleviation, um, well, well, every, lots of people know that China has done a great job in alleviating poverty. But I also read that Vietnam has also done a very good job in alleviating poverty. And since Vietnam is a Southeast Asian country, I think Vietnam, as long as, as well as China, of course, can provide a kind of a model lesson for other Southeast Asian countries to learn how to alleviate poverty. Um, then it comes to the point of education. Uh, Professor Tay King soon talked about, you know, getting lots of students together um, in cheap and uh, good housing in you know, Singapore university campuses. I think that's a good idea, but in my honest opinion, I think that's a hardware problem. Um, that's a hardware matter, and it's, it's good that it's a good hardware idea. But in my honest opinion, since the days of Lee Kuan Yew, I think Singapore universities have a bit of a software problem in the sense that from Lee Kuan Yew's time to even now, I think the Singapore government... Um, sometimes can be a bit wary and leery of too much dissent and uh, protests on university campuses. I mean, a classic example of that is the Yale NUS College finally became just the NUS College or something like that. You know, Yale is taken out of the picture. And my own personal guess is that the Singapore government doesn't want a kind of the freewheeling liberal arts, uh, sometimes rebellious uh, spirit of Yale University to be replicated in Singapore colleges. Um, you know, I, I mean, Lee Kuan Yew, I think, was very unhappy. Like, in the 1970s, there were all these American student protests against Richard Nixon, against um, the Vietnam War, and, and campuses at Yale. And uh, Lee, that's why Lee Kuan Yew had a short hair movement um, uh, when he was Prime Minister of Singapore in the 70s. He banned uh, Singapore men from having long hair because Lee Kuan Yew didn't want Singapore men to be, and Singapore students to be inspired by all these student protests that was rocking American campuses in the 60s and the 70s and the hippie movement. So actually, I mean, I think actually Professor Taking Su has a very good idea of situating this ASEAN University in Johor, because at least it, the, a campus there will be more free from the restrictions on the academic thinking and the freedom of academic thought than if it were uh, it, uh, situated in Singapore. Yeah, those are my ideas. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Han Shi. Um, we have a, a guest, I uh, think, from overseas, Mr. Mark Woodward. Uh, Mark, if you uh, don't mind, uh, I've already unmuted you. Mm -hmm. Are you American, can I ask? Yes, I am. All right, so what Mr. Han Shi mentioned about the uh, relationship between US and China, what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> The relationship between the U.S. and China is, is problematic at the moment, and there is a, there's there's potential for escalation there. I honestly don't expect to see it move beyond kind of a low level a tit per tat, almost name calling type of things. The real flashpoint in the region is, of course, um, the West Philippine Sea and China's China's illegal incursions into Philippine sovereign territory. I don't think China is going to risk escalating that situation because they have too much to lose, and that in in the end, that Chinese pragmatism is going to overcome their ideologically driven expansionism. So I, 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 I suspect that there will be some ongoing tensions, but I don't think they're going to escalate into things like um, the 
armed conflict, and I don't think they're going to escalate into uh, economic boycotts between the two countries because neither one of them can afford it. Um, okay, right. Um, yeah, so actually, I think Han Shui is aware Taiwan elections is up, uh, I think, this month or next month. So uh, there's a little bit of tension in Asia now because they are worried that uh, if the elections don't appear to go uh, to the uh, either side, whether China or Taiwan, then the U.S. may get involved. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on that, Han Shui? Well, actually, I quite agree with the learned American professor who spoke just now. Um, the former South China Morning Post chief editor, Mr. Wang Xiangwei, a mainland Chinese man, spoke last year at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Hong Kong, saying that for several years going ahead, China has no plan to invade Taiwan because uh, China needs to grow its economy. And China saw what happened to Russia after it invaded Ukraine. You know, America and Europe put tons and tons, lots of... Um, sanctions on America, the Russia that hurt Russia's economy. And uh, according to Mr. Wang, China cannot afford that. China doesn't want America to sanction and the Europe and other countries to sanction China if it invades Taiwan. So I don't see a invasion of Taiwan in, in at least the next uh, 10 years. Okay, cool. Um, uh, if you, Mr. Woodward, do you have any questions for the panel or uh, can I move on? Oh, to oh. One observation here, there's a lot of visionary thinking here. Uh, there's a lot of very, very visionary thinking that in a way reminds me of the sort that Buckminster Fuller was talking about in the 1960s uh, that involves hypermodern, very centralized planning. In another sense, a lot of the talking here, a lot of the visions here remind me very much of very ancient Southeast Asian patterns. I'm here thinking of old, basically maritime-based trading states like Srivijaya, which did achieve or some of the types of regional integration that that we've been talking here. So there's a mixture of the there's a mixture of the old and the new in in this I don't know sort of new vision for a revitalized um, ASEAN. One thing I have I have some reservations about is that I think one has to really stress protection of the agency of rural and Kampong people, and that doesn't mean that means more than incorporating them into e-commerce systems. That means preserving the autonomy of, of rural people, uh, particularly in Indonesia, also of indigenous people. And those are those are issues that that have to be considered. Okay. Um, you mentioned the name Buckminster. I think uh Prof T is uh, quite familiar with that name. Uh Prof, you want to say anything? Mm. Yes, I, 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 I think that uh, <clears throat> I, I, I take a Mark, Mark's point that um, the rural, you see, I, I raised this question about why is it that we must bring a highly stressed out way of life into the kampongs? <laughs> why, why is it not a good thing that a more relaxed life should also exist within the kampongs, right? But there are also other reasons why the kampong culture uh, needs both, right? Because there's a, a huge amount of poverty in the kampongs as well, right? So the uh, the e-commerce idea is actually uh, to allow for a flow of uh, 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 money and capital resources into the village, right? to support the kind of lifestyle, uh, the, the more relaxed lifestyle in the village. So it's not either or, it's probably uh, the idea of both, you know, right? Uh, I, I think the Bucky Fuller kind of uh, a global, uh, w w w literally one size fits all concept, I think uh, 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 needs needs to be uh, uh, modified, right? I agree with uh, uh, 
uh, Mr. Mark on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we still have time. So I'm going to call on the uh, last commentator for this evening. Uh, that will be Dr. Ang Yong Guan. Let me just uh, put... Uh, yes. Okay. So Dr. Ang is a, a psychiatrist. Uh, he has own practice and has been interviewed by our media, Straight Times and Lian He Zhao Bao. So tonight, uh, I think uh, Yong Guan is going to talk about the mental resilience, right? Yep. Okay, okay. go ahead. Before, before I touch on mental resilience, I just want to touch on a few points mentioned by various speakers. First of all, Prof. Day say, we have the money. We have the money, but no people. People have been weakened in the last 40 years. That's, that's a very bold statement. And I I, I, I think we, we need to pay attention to this this thing about people, software, the software. Uh, and, and then he, he mentioned that Singapore scored the highest in science and maths in the world. But somehow, where is the courage? Where is the guts? Where is the uh, initiative? Again, uh, software issues. Uh. And then he went on to, to say that um, about uh, when, when Lee Kuan Yew was leading the country, it was a lot of discipline. So now when you're over-disciplined, then he say you end up with weak and complacent people. And then he mentioned, where is the creativity? Uh, discipline versus creativity. So, so far, I'm giving you this dichotomy, eh? this set of opposing ideas, eh? and, and I want you to mull over it. Eh? And then he say he met uh, Ong San Suu Kyi, and Ong San Suu Kyi say, you don't just talk about villages uh, as the village. You also talk about the villagers, the people living in the village. So again, eh, when you focus on the people, it's again software, right? Software. So that's that's one more, one, one point. And, and then he moved on to Anwar's, uh, the, the Malaysian government, Madani concept. Eh? And uh, Ismadi already said eh, that that's a kind of a, a national agenda, a national agenda from 2023. Eh? And, 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 and of the six values, other than sustainability and prosperity, the other four are software values, like... Uh, innovation, respect, trust, and compassion. So again, uh, they, they are soft, soft skills, soft skills, soft, soft values. Then he went on to talk about Jokowi. Jokowi also talked about building a cultured people, people with ethical values. Uh, again, you see, these are all software values. And Ismadi also talked about quality of life uh, and, and how do we nurture Nurture and he even mentioned about fellowship of friends at the ASEAN level. Uh, friendship again is a soft software issue, not a hardware issue. So what, what I, I'm leading to is that when you build a nation, it's not just about hardware, it's not just about infrastructure, it is also about software. Interestingly, yesterday I came across the National Geographic issue, July or is November 2017, the search for happiness. Costa Rica, Denmark, and Singapore mentioned in this magazine. And when it comes to Singapore, the emphasis is a lot on safety and security, on security and safety. They feature national service boys, and they feature... Marina, the garden by the bay, garden by the bay, as indication of happiness in Singapore. So it is a lot to do with infrastructure, a lot to do with feeling secure, secure in Singapore. And the cleanliness, the infrastructure, the garden city. But when it comes to purpose, passion, Quality, you know, it, it, it is not very really clearly defined. When it comes to people, the software, the values, the belief system of the people, it is poorly defined. So let me let me say, uh, well, we're happy with, it's a garden city, infrastructure. We're happy with the garden by the bay, infrastructure. We're happy with money. We have lots of money, financial happiness, 
financial stability. As far as the government is concerned, never mind what property is, the cost of living is a separate issue. So when you measure all these measurable things, we score very highly. When we measure the non-measurable things, courage, guts, initiative, all these become, you know, we're not very clear. All right? So I want to introduce a concept of moving forward. How do we build a resilient nation? To me, it is balancing the left brain and the right brain. Let me explain. Let me explain. This is the brain, okay? You have the left. The left is about performance. The left is about doing things, measurable things, KPI, right? Guidelines, rules, achievements, accolades, trophies. You can measure with your left brain. But the right brain is a different ball game. The right brain is seeing the overall picture. It's opening up your horizon. The right brain is about creativity. The right brain is about innovation. The right brain is about hobbies. It's about spirituality, connecting with God, connecting with nature, connecting with dogs and cats, and about developing the whole person. So you need to combine the left and the right brain moving forward. It is balancing the left and the right. The right is about GDP, measurable things. The left, that's the left. The right is about quality of life, appreciation of beauty, building resilience, innovation, compassion, empathy, love for the nation, love for each other, values, beliefs, philosophy of life, soft skills. So both must be balanced. When you are able to balance your left and the right, in me, to me, it is harmony of life. It is the beauty of life. And then you are resilient. You are able to move forward. And to me, that is building resilience for the future. Okay. Thank and the you, acronym uh, I use is O-P-E-N, open. Because the right is about opening up. The left is very narrow, focusing on KPI. The right is open. So let's open with our five finger. Open. Every time you see a problem, let's be open. Let's be open. When we're open, we are orientated to all possible options. And we are, O is orientation, orientation, focus, paying attention to the positive, to the high energy level, to what will drive us together as a nation, as a community, as a regional force, orientation, not orientating to the negative. P is yeah, purpose. Yeah. What is the goal? What is yeah. the goal? What are we doing? What is the goal? What is the purpose? E is engagement, which some of you spoke about just now, to engage each other in a community. And engagement can only be possible when our minds are open. When our minds are closed, we clash. When our minds are open, we engage. And lastly, N, O-P-E-N. N is nurturing, nurturing each other. But you must nurture yourself first, sleep well, eat well, and exercise then you can nurture others. And that is the acronym O-P-E-N for moving forward, developing the right brain and balancing it with the left brain. And that's all I have to say as a psychiatrist contributing to nation building moving forward, activating the right brain and balancing it with the left. So you have KPIs, you have GDP growth, and you have quality of life in the form of a right brain, left brain balance. Thank you. Alfred, back to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ang. Uh, I think we have a question uh, from uh, one of our participants, Mr. Dennis uh, uh, Lim. Uh, Dennis, can you unmute yourself? 
Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a yeah. semi-retired person. Uh, used to, uh, run, uh, few businesses. Um, I have some interesting points, you know, that were uh, comments to to some of the points that were raised. Um, I think the first thing that we is regards to Singapore's foreign policy. Um, uh, I think that in the context of the current geopolitical uh, contest between China and the US, uh, unfortunately, Singapore comes out as being overly in the West, in the US camp. And while it may have served Singapore's purpose adequately and, and you know, in the past, I think there needs to be a very serious reevaluation of um, Singapore's position in between these two giants. And I think the pivot, there is a need to pivot away from the American-centric uh, uh, world, so to speak. Why do I say this? Well, in many of the points that Professor Tay has brought up, you talk about developing... Um, the urban-rural divide. Who does better infrastructure than the Chinese? The Americans can't do it. Their build back, back better is nothing but rhetoric. Okay, the Chinese, um, through their development banks, are actually providing more funding than the IMF. You know, the IMF is basically has very little funding. You know, and even... To give you an example, I mean, the fact that uh, uh, I've been to China many times, you know, the pace of development is it's just breathtaking. To you know, and I would encourage every American get your passport, go and travel China, because what they lifted eight hundred million people out of poverty. They have a middle class of 400 million, which is bigger than the entire population of the USA. And even though the world economy is slowing down, you can see it in Europe, Germany's in recession, Japan, two quarters negative growth. Taiwan is slowing down. Yet China is still powering ahead, very much because of the strength of its domestic spending. So there are a lot of lessons we can learn from China. Now, I think the, the relationship with China, I think traditionally many in South Asia have looked at China in a very adversarial, suspicious manner. You know, perhaps because of the past communist party links, you know, in the past and all that. But if you look at it very objectively speaking from the matrices, every other country in the world has, you know, in the recent Bell and Road uh, meeting they had, more than 140 over countries, you know, went for that meeting. And they, I, I have actually traveled enough to see some of the positive developments that China has, has done. Very good example, most recent example, is a high-speed rail between Jakarta and Bandung. Built slightly delayed because of COVID. But today, right now, they've already transported more than a million people on whoosh. You know, they already started off with like something like 14 trips a day. Now it's full capacity. And you're, cut, you're, you're talking about cutting travel time from three hours to 40 minutes. You know, traveling at 350 kilometers per hour. Now, like it or not, China has a big plan for high-speed rail in Southeast Asia. Laos has been a beneficiary of it. Vietnam, certainly talking with China. Thailand, late in the game, but also very eager to, you know, to tie up with, with China. And I see that there are a lot of positive developments. Um... We don't need to reinvent the wheel. China has already shown us in so many areas. In if you talk about climate change, China is the largest, is has the largest in terms of square area 
afforestation in the world. You know, I used to visit Beijing. You have your typical sandstorms at the end of the year. Now you don't get it. Hardly any. Why? Because they put they, their tree planting north of Beijing is just immense. It's just almost the size of Belgium. You know, so if you talk about uh, Professor Tay talk about bamboo. This year alone, you know, the Chinese government said, look, we want to use bamboo as a replacement for plastics. They've already announced it, three-year plan. They already got everything all laid out. We don't need to invent the wheel. Learn upon the, tap upon the Chinese expertise. They have the economies of scale. You talk about e-commerce, they're already e-commerce players in the region, you know, I mean, you just need to go to China, you can see all the farmers doing um, live stream selling. Very, very successful. And you can go, when you're in China, even when you buy from the most remote place in China, it will reach your address within 48 hours. That's the extent of the deliverables, you know, in terms of the logistic networks. Because China is not about cheap manufacturing. They've already done what we call vertical integration in terms of everything from sourcing raw materials, you know, manufacturing, distribution, re-exporting. So if you look at it, yes, there's a lot of business. ASEAN does more business with China than with the US. You know, ASEAN does, I think, like almost a billion dollars annually. Whereas I think with trade with the US is only like maybe half of that. So we know where the market is. The market is China. China's buying all the durians, <laughs> you know? So if you look at it this way, I mean, the, there's, there's no reason to feel that why uh, we should, you know, I, especially from Singapore's perspective, I think that we are out of step with the rest of ASEAN in in um you know bettering relations with china and i i actually worry for singapore because one of the biggest challenges in singapore i think is the issue of you know tying up with the us military the issue is this is the word interoperability this is something that ex um australian Prime Minister Hawkeating already mentioned. There's no distinction in, in, in US military interoperability. There's no distinction between whether you're a Japanese soldier, a South Korean, a Singaporean, you know, a Filipino, an Australian. In the event of a hot war, a conflict in East Asia, invariably, there's no distinction whether you're a Singaporean or not. And that's why I, my concern is why are we having people, our own soldiers training in Guam, you know, or, or in Okinawa? Why? You may say, well, because we've invested so much in military um, uh, cooperation, so to speak. But my question is, why can Singapore not adopt a more um, independent foreign policy, very much like Vietnam? If you know Vietnam's foreign policy, it's the three no's. No military bases, no military alliances, you know, um, no military forces in the country. And they have done a very, very, very good job with that, you know, over the years. So I think what Singaporeans, Singapore is at a stage where it's, it's, a, it's a period of change. And that's foreign policy. Within the country, there's an issue of aspirations. You know, the wealth gap between the very rich very and people struggling in Singapore is pretty evident. And it's going to be made worse because of the increase in cost of living because of the increase in GST. Why we have GST, I don't know. In so fact, I think the GST is, should have been zero exam for food items. Yeah, Dennis, I think, I like think what we, all of us agree yeah. about your... Uh, the so, the, so the issue here is this. The issue in Singapore is for the young people, what is their aspirations that they can hope for? It's very, very easy to be sucked in into the 
the the material world in Singapore. And I agree with you know the fact that Singaporeans need to re-examine where have a heart. Um very good example. Every student in a top school wants to be a doctor, a lawyer, you know, because these are the best high paying jobs. Uh, that is quite interesting. Think, uh... Yeah, but the, the fact the fact of me that there's more to it than that, you see. Can't hear you. Sorry, I can't hear you. Hello. Yes. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. What, what, what you have said actually reflects <laughs> the reason why we are having this kind of uh, discussions <laughs> because Singapore has now reached a different stage, right? All I the agree. kind of yeah. problems that that uh, you have identified, right, have been with us since uh, the global city days. You know, where I think Lee Kuan Yew had to accommodate all the international investors, right? And to tame the Singaporeans. And what we are seeing now is the tame Singaporean <laughs> who have all the kind of uh, problems that you have identified. But let me summarize uh, the, the discussions uh, th throughout this uh, uh, two hours. Huh? I have uh, eight points uh, which I summarize from what have been said so far. Okay, I think number one, is the, the point made by Hani about peace, right? There's no way we can progress without peace. If there's a lot of uh, social conflict, a lot of uh, 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 terrorism, a lot of uh, 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 fighting going on and, you know, between within countries as well as between countries, then there will be no way to, to progress. So peace is very important. And I think she made a very important point that you have to overcome you have to cross over from different religious and cultural and ethnic divisions that exist, right? So we need to cultivate that, right? Now, the other point which was uh, made by uh, uh, Hanshi is about the, the kind of university that we have, right? Which has been uh, uh, very, very much uh, uh, constrained by, by uh, authoritarian uh, controls imposed by the government. And that's the reason why the the Yale NUS uh, program was terminated because the Yale uh, program, uh, I mean, Yale is a very open kind of university concept, right? Whereas Singapore, uh, the university is very much a controlled university, right? Um, now, uh, Yusmadi also mentioned about the, the, the uh, he, 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 he laid a lot of stress on the necessity for regional economy and also the regional dialogue between uh, 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 different groups in the in the region, and, uh, and that is totally uh, 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 very very important. Now, the 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 point uh, which uh, uh, Mr. Lim made just now about the, the 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 that China is the only people, the only country that's capable of building uh, transport infrastructure, right? The 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 BRI initiative and so on, right? Uh, yes, they will have to do this. Uh, it will take time, right? But the most important thing is that in the meantime, right, vertical takeoff aircraft is absolutely crucial because without that, we cannot wait until the, the, the road system and so on comes on stream. The, the, China, the China example of why e-commerce works very well in, in resolving the rural-urban dichotomy is because China invested a lot in roads and railway systems over the last 30 years. And that's the reason why it is possible to ship goods and people across boundaries uh, in uh, in great distances and that's why e-commerce works right um mr mark from uh, uh university of arizona made the point about um, that 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 has to be variability in the lifestyle choices that that people make but the point i make is that yes i agree like lifestyle choices must be available right you want to live slow you want to live fast that's a choice right but uh it is only possible when there is a viable economic setting in which you can be uh, economically supported. But if you are in a permanent state of poverty, right, then I don't think you can have a lifestyle choice. So choice, be, choice is dependent on viability, right? So the job of, uh, of development is to, pro is to produce the kind of economic viability, right? Okay. Now, uh, 
the okay there's another point about uh, mr lim mentioned about the china model right i think that is the 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 essential conflict between the us and 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 china right now right because the china model has proven to be successful right although it is a it is a centralized uh, uh, model at the top at the top of the the political pyramid but but it's democratic at the base right so this is the difference right whereas in the american model right they 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 talk a lot about democracy right but democracy has been exploited by the rich and powerful for their own gain right so this is the 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 weakness of of the of the, the of the uh, american democratic model right which is being shown up now very clearly right in the disparity in the in the in the incomes in 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 america the failure of the uh, infrastructure in america all the bridges are falling down and so on so this is the problem right now as as to the left brain and right brain issue which was raised by by uh, uh professor uh, dr uh, ang yong guan right i completely agree and i want to show this you see that the solution to the school problem right because our schools are almost entirely devoted to the left brain uh uh uh, development right but but this is the book that i'm going to publish uh, by 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 uh, uh early uh, 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 early this year right uh, the publisher told me today that it will be out before chinese new year that means before the 10th of february this book will be out because scouting right is the remedy is the balance between the left brain and the right brain right the right brain is scouting the left brain is our present school examination system thank you all very much for this uh, uh, opportunity for this, this discussion, discussion. Yeah, yeah i, I think, think that, that uh, there, there will be opportunity, opportunity for us to develop these ideas further right, right? I, I, I want to i, I want, want to to to, to suggest, suggest that, 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 that for example honey's honey's idea, idea about peace development right and so on should be a topic of for, for, for discussion, discussion in the next round, round right uh, use money's idea, idea of, uh, of of regional uh, conversations, conversations and development should be another topic, topic right uh, the, the, the the topic, topic of, of lifestyle choices is a, a very important issue as well because because in the building of new asia we do not want to end up with a totalitarian system right okay so this so there are many many issues right and and and, 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 and mr lim's concern about about uh, uh, learning, learning from, from China. China. Yes, we, we should learn from China. China. We, we should also learn from the mistakes of the of United, United States and, and Western, Western Europe. Europe. So, so we, we must, must learn, learn from everybody. everybody. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you all very much. much. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Day and uh, commentators, uh, Yusmadi, Anshi, Hani, and Dr. Ang Yong Guan. Uh, I'd like to ask everybody to just turn on their video. It's a tradition we have at the end of every Zoom uh, to take a screenshot of everybody showing happy faces. <laughs> so I'll ask my colleague, uh, Aldrin, to uh, get ready to screenshot everyone. Aldrin, uh, you take control. So if everyone doesn't mind, uh, please turn on your cameras so that we can have a nice uh, group uh, photograph. Thank you very much, uh, Miss Lucy, Mr. Allen, Mr. Patrick, uh, if you don't mind, uh, it would be nice to have you uh, on screen. Okay, uh, and everyone, uh, in the meanwhile, yeah, you can get ready, prepare your brightest smiles for the start of the new year, especially. Okay, uh, Richard as well, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm okay, we're just gonna capture whatever we can, whoever we can. Um, everyone, on the count of uh, three, two, one, smile. Okay, another one, ready, one, two. Three smile. <laughs> right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, for the core members of uh, Friday Conversations, uh, Huni, that's you. Uh, don't leave. Uh, we have a short meeting after this. Let me just.